Good afternoon. My name is Gregory McCooch, and I'm the Defense Intelligence Agency Agency's representative here at the Naval War College. I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker today. Lieutenant General Glavy serves as the Deputy Commandant for Information for the United States Marine Corps. He serves as the commander for Marine Forces Strategic Command. And just in case, you know, those two jobs weren't time consuming enough for him, he also serves as the Director of Marine Corps Intelligence. And in those three capacities, General Glavy is responsible for how the Marine Corps uses information, intelligence, and cyber in pursuit of tactical, operational, strategic objectives for the Marine Corps in steady state, crisis, contingency, and conflicts around the world. Today, Lieutenant General Glavy is going to talk about information as a warfighting function. Without further ado, General Glavy. Thank you, sir. All right. So I guess the one thing I really want to get right before I dive into my comments is thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for continuing to serve. Obviously, you're very successful in what you do and to get you to this point in life, which means you have plenty of opportunities. The fact that you're here studying bigger, stronger, better, faster, back to the fleet, back to the operating forces and critical planning, though it just says a lot about you. So if I don't do anything right uh, in my precious time with you is, is really uh, to thank you. This is a slide, I use variations of this slide, but if I could tell you a quality that's so required today uh, at probably any rank, but certainly at a leadership rank, it's this idea of change. I, I know that sounds very simplistic, but change in execution is perhaps one of the hardest things one could possibly do. I've had a little bit of advantage here. Uh, uh, on my best day, I'm a, a fleet average helicopter pilot, uh, spent most of my adult life in, in aviation uh, and found myself in this world, spending six of the last uh, eight years of it smack dab in, in the middle of this, whether up at Fort Meade uh, for, for five years or now down here in, in, in the Pentagon. I, I've had no other course of action except this one, right, or, or, or die or get run over or get thrown out of the out of the building. So this idea of change, though, uh, the key ingredient, certainly looking in the mirror, is this idea of humility, right? If we don't walk into the place with this sense of humility about ourselves, we're going to screw this up. Uh, yeah. And, and I think as I see in the building now, I, th I think this is really starting to happen. And, and I put this JP1 up there. I know, I don't know if you're, you know, I've done four tours in, in the Pentagon. So this idea of joint uh, a doctrine being part of a slide uh, may, may uh, make you cringe. This is really, if you haven't read it, is really well done. And this chapter specifically, uh, I think really gets at the nuance of where we find ourselves and really ultimately where you find yourselves, especially if you end up in, in planning buildings. Ch billets. Change is not for the faint of heart. It, it is not. Uh, and there are so many positive things about, you know, the reluctance to change. Of course, you know, as an aviator, we say that change is the mother of all risk, right? Some author once said, if you do something 10,000 times, you're really going to be good at it. In aviation, this idea of change from changing flight schedules to changing ordnance loadouts to, to, to st scheduled times and crews all have to have approval processes, right? That just doesn't happen. Hey, you, do you want to go flying? Do you want to go flying? Right? It doesn't happen. So, so again, there's a lot of risk there, right? There's a lot of risk, right? People get hurt. We break things. Again, obviously a category in of itself. But, but this, this is different, right? We have to, you know, as part of our DNA, understand the change we find ourselves in. And I'm just reporting back from the Pentagon. Like, we have no choice. The depth sec death, like, she's a force of one making this happen, good or bad. And I think the Marine Corps, because of force design has set us on a path that makes this a little more adaptable, consumable, though sometimes I wonder. All right, here we go. We've been here before. You know, you're in an elite institution studying things like this, but the Marine Corps and the Joint Force have found ourselves in awkward places in history. And this just happens to be a Marine Corps example, but a very powerful one. Uh, I've had in both of my tours as a Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Command, have General Dunford 
talk, right? If you haven't, this is his, I'm stealing his stuff right now. But but he talks about this. His old man was part of this, this fire brigade that goes off and fights uh, in, in Korea. But of course, you know, how, how it all happens, Marine Corps goes from over 400,000 down to about uh, 30,000 Marines, right? Uh, North Koreans come over 30th parallel, roll the whole uh, peninsula up all the way down to the small city of Pusan. What's left is the Pusan perimeter and enter this Marine Provisional Brigade, right? Soon to be called the Fire Brigade. The, the, this is not a hodgepodge, right? This is our best and brightest. These are World War II vets. Uh, the leadership is top notch. This is the tenderloin of the Marine Corps. So Fehrenbach, in his very kind words, certainly provides a characterization of what you would expect as Marines, most of you, right? The honor, courage, and commitment, the discipline, the focus, the persistence. But at the end of the day, all that matters, really matters, and you know that. But, but they don't show up with plastic knives and forks to a gunfight. They show up with advantages, very thoughtful, innovative, disruptive advantages. Of course, in the middle is that crazy thing called a helicopter. We're taking them literally out of the, out of the wrappings from Sikorsky, right? Literally, uh, the elder who's building them himself and we put it right into the fight. And ultimately this thing becomes the fire brigade is because this idea of reconnaissance from three to 5,000 feet is, is mind numbing, right? The ability to actually see the adversary, understand the adversary in ways never done before, right? We, we are able to kind of do this fire brigade thing because we have ability to execute reconnaissance and truly understand where the adversary is gonna be and what they're gonna do. Of course, on the left there, there's nothing fancy about an escort carrier full of F4Us that are, you know, the pride of World War II and the island hopping campaign. But at this point in our history, the Marine Corps is doing close air support and really getting the art of combined arms going. And that's what we're doing. We're spending a lot of time on that. So that chocker block full of airplanes becomes this idea of combined arms, close air support, and ultimately the start of the MAGTAP, right? So, so there's a lot going on. There's a lot of disruption and innovation going on that gives this this, this force, moral to the physical is three is to one, advantages, real asymmetric advantages. Ultimately, this super bazooka, the 3.5 inch uh, rocket propel grenade is, is, is changes the whole face of the battle. The Russian T-34 tanks at this point in time are unstoppable, right? The 2.37 inch bouncing off, of course, 3.5 inch goes through and everything suddenly changes. And certainly Fehrenbach is right about what he said about those Marines or, or any part of the joint force. And I'm, you know, I'm parochially using Marines as an example, but at the end of the day, right, they show up with an advantage. An advantage, certainly with a technology piece to it, but people making it happen. What's our advantage? You know, here we are, 2024, right? We are in the middle of this change per JP1. I think the leaders that are gonna lead in the future probably understand it better than the people who have provided the technology and capabilities that we need to bring to bear. It's, it's, it will all change and change rapidly as we look at different initiatives being done by Office of Secretary of Defense. But, but ultimately, right, it's, it's going to be here. It's got to be here. This is going to be whoever can win this fight is gonna have the advantage ultimately. And certainly everything that we do as Marines parochially at range 400, locate and close with and destroy through fire and maneuver is all part of it, don't underestimate it. But at the end of the day, back to that asymmetric advantage of how we show up to the fight, what it's gonna be, we, we gotta do this. And we gotta do it well, and we gotta do it fast. And we gotta do it in ways that we're not understanding of today, but we gotta make sure the leaders of tomorrow truly understand the power of this, but this is the future. And of course, this idea of information is, is being set to another scale, which has to be worrisome, right? On the, on the left there, classic, you know, spent five years up at, at you know, Cyber Command. Love to tell you about Colonial Pipeline sometime and in an in appropriate classification and all the great job that our Marines did in the middle of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, almost predictable what's on the left. 
right? Classic, right? What, what we would come up with as we do course of action development, but, but, but what's happening on the right is probably even more worrisome, right? That, that gets into, soaks into our, our culture and our civilization. We gotta be very concerned about it. We can't talk about data without talking about space. Uh, probably one of the things I am most proud of it Mar4 Cyber, when I commanded it, is the Commandant asked me to stand up Mar4 Space, and then we commanded it out of Fort Meade. And there was a lot of pushback. Why? Why is the Marine Corps, why is the Marine Corps doing space? You know, why, why is this? But well, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm here to tell you, no space, no chance. So I haven't spent my adult life in aviation, and, and everybody understands how the JFAC works and the KOC, and, and you know, the first thing that happens in any old plan, right? We got to get air air superiority, we got to gain an advantage in the air domain because so much else res, res, uh, relies on it. Well, this is the ultimate high ground. No space, no chance, don't, don't bother, don't, don't, don't bother. This is critical as we move forward more and more, space, the ultimate high ground, space infinitesimal, where does it, where does it start, where does it end, right? 2.99 times 10 to the eighth meters per second is our limb fact in space. Right? And how we're going to take advantage of that really is thought provoking. And, you know, now I'm a data guy. Now I'm a cyber guy. Now I'm a network guy. Now I'm an Intel guy. Now, now I'm, I'm doing all that in the battle space. So let's think totally different on how we're going to use space and how important it is to be the, the best possible partners that you can and be the best customer, the best user, the best, the best operator and, and how space is, is actually going to play out. People say it's fragile. Maybe certainly like that, that helicopter that I showed you earlier, or when Mitchell went out and bombed the USS Osprey lands and sank it in 1920, right? Fragile, yeah, perhaps. But man, daily, that shit's changing, right? Daily. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but the Russians, perhaps the best EW-capable nation, uh, certainly pre-Ukraine, man, they're having a hell of a time here. Hell of a time. Uh, of course, really proud of this. We put this together, but John Glenn's third orbit or, uh, and Fredship 7 is this picture of Polaroid that he took from the capsule of, of Sunrise. And believe it or not, it's over the South China Sea. So when we made our Mar 4 space emblem, we captured all that good Marine that he, that he was. No space, no chance. Glavy's view, but I'm telling you, it's, it's very much how we're proceeding. And there's obviously a whole microprocessor technology aspect to this, and it, it don't stop. Right. We all thought Moore's law was going to end 2020, 2021. But but our ability to execute the the uh, the, the etching of these chips is only increased and improved. Of course, the hockey stick inflection point is right around where this crazy, nutty thing called the cloud was. It started out as a buzzword similar to AI and ML. They're they're all buzzwords until you bring it to practical application and drive outcomes. Right, and that's exactly, as we mass data, right, in a cloud environment, right, we can mass storage, we can mass computation, and we can do things at scale that you can't do in other places. I know it's basic logic, but, but until you unwrap that and understand how all the rest of your network's gotta work and where your data really matters, if you're gonna be a data-centric organization, understanding the power of the cloud and the ability to mass, right, moose must, really important. So, so where does this all collide? I'm in a great schoolhouse, so I might as well go here. I'm, I was tempted to remove this slide, but he who will not risk cannot win, right? So the guy on the left is infatuated with the guy on the right, right? And this idea of commandership and why Napoleon was so successful is this idea of, you know, fingertip feel. He knew the battle space. He, he could sense it. And he had that sixth sense. Obviously, he had a hell of a lot of experience. Uh, and, and so all internalized, you know, amazing minds, certainly, end of the day, he fails, fails miserably, one might uh, add. And, and so as we have this discussion on data centricity, we're, we're bringing something else into the fight, something that has to have perhaps a little more of a role than it traditionally has. We've made, made plenty of poor decisions, you know, wasn't in the room, I've made plenty of poor decisions and I was in the room, but, but certainly as a nation on why or why not we should do something. And, uh, 
I, I'm always just to share with you in, you know, in the three star, four star discussions in the, okay, where's all our facts. If we're going to go to the comment on with the decision, make sure we got all the data, right. And make sure, you know, that we have a sound discussion because where we're going to go, of course, just like Napoleon, we go with our gut. And that's what we do. We go with our gut. We love it. Our experience, especially people my age, we, we frame that experience and we frame it. We put it on something. And sometimes it's beautiful. It's a great match. And you're, you're amazing. You're a hero. And sometimes not so much. Right? We, we can't risk that. that. So I'm not taking away anything of what Clausewitz talked about and the power of, of that sixth sense of understanding the battle, not for a second, the more experienced, the more better, right? But things are changing so fast that one has to make sure they don't show up with gaps back to those advantages. And how do you do that? You know, right now it's, it's making sure that we truly gain ultimate, ultimate decision advantage. It's what it ultimately comes down to. I've been watching the 18th Airborne Corps very closely. I think as Marines, most of you in this room, you need to understand 18th Airborne got it going on, y'all. Got it going on. They're concerned about two things, command and control. You know, we like to say General Milley has given them a front seat and all the, I've watched them. I've been there, been to the bowling alley in Wiesbaden where they executed Task Force Dragon, where they went from executing a NEO mission upon arrival to executing a maintenance and a training mission for 155 and HIMARS to executing a third party reception of, of all coalition equipment to executing a full blown targeting cycle, right? Same staff, all data centric. They, they, they're enamored by it. From General Corella, obviously the CENTCOM commander to General, General Donahue, right? That's their thing. As we worry about force offerings for contingencies and crises around the world, they're doing AI enabled course of action development. Man, um, you, you, you can write that down. Maybe a little, little bit of, uh, you know, I, you know, back to the commandant with that. But, but so, so important, right? Got to give them credit. And uh, I'm watching them and we're fast followers. We've been taught this lesson before how to operate in the information environment, how to use the cyber domain, how to use information as a warfighting function has been taught to us. In the past, I was at U.S. Cyber Command when all this went down. And you talk about being flat-footed, looking in the mirror, uh, you know, not ready for this. Not ready for out of the northern Iraqi desert comes this ragtag group and upgun Toyota Hilux pickup trucks with Android 6 and hotspots and VSAT and some graphics capabilities and through the information environment and using information as a warfighting function, they proceed to take over two countries. We could argue, have a good discussion on that intellectual discussion, but watching it up close and personal, man, this was not Zarqawi, right? Sawing off heads, you know, excuse the visual, right? This, this was theater, right? That really powerful messaging. This was deep, Cognitive, they go from tens of followers to hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands to, to, to hundreds of thousands to millions of followers. People buying it, buying it. Just saying, right? Dark side of the force, but, but we've been taught this. And of course, the far left corner was very real when, you know, they're coming for Baghdad. Man, this was not, this was awkward, very awkward. But they controlled, they controlled the cyber domain, specifically freedom of maneuver, and they are they're able to use information in ways perhaps our lack of imagine, imagination didn't allow us to. Of course, it all changes. October 2015, Paris turns into a video game, 130 people dead on the streets. Finally, 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 right, hey, y'all, we gotta do something. And I was I was, I was there, of course, out of my league, per se, with Admiral Gilday, CNO Gilday, one of my dear friends, and uh, go anywhere with him. Uh, General Nakasone is there. General Hawk shows up a little bit later. But, but some of these heroes in the cyber domain are beginning to rally around Cybercom, putting some of this together. And so we create Joint Task Force Ares, if you're familiar with, with it. And uh, General Nakasone is really the first commander 
of JTF areas, but it was CyberCom's response to the joint force and how we're going to get after this. How are we going to disrupt, and that was a key word, their ability to move, maneuver in the cyber domain. We had to stop it. Like we had to stop the theater. We had to stop the Cecil B. DeMille quality that they were bringing to bear. I mean, this was not, this, this was high-end stuff. This was varsity stuff, uh, what they were doing. And so JTF Aries comes on the scene and, and you know, get some runtime going and, and, and proves to be successful from a metrics standpoint on their ability, again, back to disrupt what the adversary was doing. And, uh, and to this day, you know, still on it, uh, JTF Aries has pivoted from, and this is how important this uh, capability was from, from counterterrorism into great power competition. I arrived back after my little two-year vacation as a commanding general, second Marine aircraft wing, love and life back into a very comfortable environment that I know and love. On a March afternoon, raining outside of a church in Camp Lejeune, General Neller tells me I'm going back to Fort Meade. Hoorah. Arrive, and, and General Nakasone is now Commander Cyber Command, and he gives the Marine Corps this mission. Marines were at the center of it. They had the best terrain, per se. But then we had it, he, he gave it from a C2 standpoint. So what he did next floored me. He says, Skirt, the first thing, first uh, mission I'm going to give you is I want to totally declassify what JTF Aries did. And I want you to sit down on National Public Radio, do a bot podcast and a full interview for publication. This is TSSCI. You can only imagine uh, NSA and what everybody else was doing. But we did. We totally released this. So back to this information environment and how one operates in there. Nakasone is obviously an expert at this, and he is brilliant. Uh, but this highly classified, classified mission right, becomes unclassified. And now we tell the world that we're at it. Good or bad, you know, it's not going not gonna to solve world hunger. But now you're engaged. You're in the fight. Really powerful. Of course, our adversaries are great at this, right? The Russians got help. It's all built on a lie. Soviet Union, right? No, no one does it better. No one understands this. Include the cyber piece of it as well. They're really, really good. They're this good, right? Very mem members when Crimea happened, just a freak, freak of luck, you know. Uh, no, no, it's really well thought out. Again, never underestimate your adversary. When we do that, we always find ourselves in such awkward places. But all this stuff on top is happening, right? State Department, man. Why, why, you know, someone's crashing into their networks, right? And they, terrible, like a volleyball match. The Pentagon, 14 days. Now we're shut down 14 days as a cyber command for that. And of course, uh, the White House, right? Why, 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 you know, would, would the Russians be so interested in the senior level decision-making organizations? Well, of course, right? If you were an Intel officer and your commander said, hey, Go provide me the intentions of the adversary. You would figure something out, but I bet you'd go to these three places. And Crimea, good, bad, dark side of the force, wildly successful. And we make fun of it, little green man, you know, you remember all that, right? Wildly successful. Need to know that. Information environment, winning as a war fighting function, making it happen. And the main effort is, is information, truly is. The ones and zeros of the... You know, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. So Nakasone, obviously, General Nakasone has been here, been done this. And, uh, you know, I will tell you, his mind is more from a meso information cognitive approach on how he looks at things, even though he's the Dernza and U.S. Cyber Command. You'd think he want to brick every server and et cetera, exploit every one of them. But, but it's a cognitive fight at the end of the day. And this idea of taking the most exquisite intel, TSSCI, at the highest crazy level, right, and totally declassifying for public release on newspapers all across the world. Bold stroke. Disrupt, degrade, you know, di didn't, you know, it, it certainly changed the course, the course of history probably changed certainly the course of events and, you know, success or failure, however this turns out, right? But again, operating in this environment, right? This information 
warfighting function environment that I will tell you Paul Nakasone really created and made it art and science. But, you know, not for the faint of heart, right? You can imagine having, you know, even as the director of NSA, having this discussion about declassifying this. Like, we don't do that. It's not our norm, right? That's not how this works. Very disruptive. Very, very disruptive. Of course, the Chinese, similar path. Similar path. You know, they have, you know, theoretically, if there's four industrial revolutions, right, they're not missing this one. They're not missing this one. They are all over this. They're all over this, you know, eye to eye, not 10 foot tall, certainly 70 inches plus or minus a few or whatever your favorite height is uh, on your PFT, CFT, but, but, but they're after this. They are, they are peer. Of course, a lot of practice, a lot of practice. When you got 1.3 billion people and they're your first priority in understanding their intentions, right? You get to uh, be masters in the digital, uh, the digital environment. And of course they have done that and then some. So there's, there's certainly, as we look at Taiwan and we look at the play of things, there's cer certainly a Wilsonian piece to this, right? Liberal democracy in Asia, a bastion of hope and all that good stuff, feel good stuff, hoorah. And there's this idea that 63% of the microprocessors made in the world, right? Made in Taiwan. Like that's real politic. And 90% uh, and of all the high-end chips are made there. And even though all the intellectual property may not be developed in Taiwan, stuff is made in ta Taiwan, important. Again, whether we're having a Wilsonian discussion or a real politique discussion, Taiwan, really, really important. And certainly things have to be balanced globally in order to do that. Very interesting thing here is we look at some of the other actions taking place. Uh, but, but believe it or not, the, the, the best etching and, and architecture of these chips Lithography, as it's referred to, is, is done by a Dutch company. A Dutch company bought an American company, blah, 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 global economy. And next thing you know, for the past 20 years, ASML has been producing what's, what's called extreme ultraviolet lithograph, like over 20 years of RDT&E, bringing to bear time now. Amazing, amazing capability you know, 15X over the, the average norm microprocessor. This is Moore's law continuing. Very important. So what are you going to do about it, right? Chinese obviously need, need a piece of the action, right? They want to keep keep pace with all this. Uh, that, that's going to be a problem. So a lot of the uh, embargo and the uh, barriers and that have been placed, right, are part of this. And the Dutch are, are kind of in the, in the middle of it. Uh, this think about this capability it takes three 747s to transport, and they're you know it's making something that fits on the the you know a hair follicle, right? That much equipment, that size, right? In order to make something so so small, but that's where we're at, right? That's where technology is taking us, and this is an ultimate advantage, one we cannot give up, certainly not easily. All right, so Marine Corps is hot on this information thing. General Nella really started it. I'll, I'll be honest with you. He comes in uh, and, and does his thing as, as a 37th commandant. He establishes, and we'll talk about some of the timeline, but he establishes information as a warfighting function. So General Nella started this off. Uh, excuse me. So General Dunford starts it off from the chairmanship, makes it a joint function, right? Information as a joint function. Of course, with uh, the secretary, it just happens to be a couple of Marines. I'm sorry there. But, uh, but and, and it leads to what the joint world is going to do. So the Marine Corps, boom, hops right on that. General Neller, General Berger, big time. And, and of course, uh, uh, General Lee Smith. And, and General Berger, right, so I walk in with General Berger as the, as the commandant, very interested in this stuff, very, very interested. And so he wants MCDP-8 written. And he is a very proactive pen in MCDP-8 as, as we were beginning to have this discussion. Okay, let's take, let's take a step back from all the lexicon wars and really have a discussion on, on information, right? Like, like we're at, the, at a company or at a platoon or even a battalion level. What are we talking about? Let's, let's be very careful, step out of 
you know, operations and the information environment, step back from a lot of the lexicon that's being laid, and let's just have a foundational discussion. And so that's what MCDP8 is. It's just this foundational discussion about what we're trying to do. It's a starting point. We're, we're already looking at rewrite, and you know, this thing is is complicated. We're not going to rest on our laurels, but 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 the bottom line, I'm telling you, this this is top down, right? Commandant, and even in all the briefings with him. He, he always wanted to understand wh whatever crisis we were in, but, but really understand it from, from an information standpoint. What's the purpose? What's the reason? Wh why is X visiting Y? Why? All these things and the, and the messages that they provide and the cognitive impact that they have, but, but very, very uh, powerful. So like everything else, we have a timeline of change. You see where all the MIGs are created. Again, that's all General Neller's work. The MEF Information Group is our starting point like anything else, got to task organize, right? First thing, got to task organize. So the MIGS is bringing a bit together those organizations, those, those units, they're going to provide a C2 capability for the MEF commander in order to get shit done, right? Really what it's all about. In order to have a purpose, method, end state, there was so many things that a MEF staff may be done, you know, signals intelligence, right? Very highly classified, really never any C2 to that gets complicated because of our relationship with the NSA, but, but, but there's no mechanism to C2 per se, and yet we're doing a lot of it. We need a C2 mission. And, and as you look at all the requirements for any type of mission like that, placement and access really matters. We'll talk about that. But, but what's the 0211 CI unit requirements? What's all the comm requirements? What's all the data requirements? As we start looking at this, from uh, uh, an information standpoint, gets complicated. In the past, we didn't care. Hey, who, who get, so sometimes, hey, what do we do with the data? Yeah, we're not so sure what we did with the data, right? So, so this matters, right? If we're going to understand the adversary, if we're going to understand what what algorithms and machine learning is going to do, like all that data, really, really matters. And you got to have a process to do all that. So, so the MIGs create that C2 node in order to do all that, and then you see the rest. MCDP8. Is, is up there, the joint pub I just referenced on the way out. And then we're, we're in the final piece is gonna sign it here in a couple of weeks, 8-10. Uh, so we went from this MCDP doctrinal discussion into practical application. And we'll talk a little bit about what, what that means, but 8-10 but is you know for the MEF staff, for the regimental staff, division staff, right? To be able to say, okay, how am I gonna do this? And there's, again, early in the process, but we're taking a lot of joint processes and now laying it, and, and just like I gave you an example about data collection in, a, in an Intel mission per se, as signals intelligence, that applies across the board. TPS-8, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, gener it's a, a, a data generating machine, right? There's a lot there to include what the adversary wants to see from that. So this is oversimplifying it, but I'm gonna go there anyway. But, but we had to start somewhere. So we basically started with with four functions from an information standpoint. Uh, obviously, we generate it, we preserve it, we project it, and we deny the adversary from doing all of the above, right? We just, just at the essence of it, there's a lot more to it than that, but, but, but just at the essence of what, where we want to go, because you got to start somewhere, and, and looking at this now in 8-10 on how we're going to do that from a practical application standpoint, that's where we started, and explanations on each and why and where. And I, you know, I take briefs, again, back to that SIGINT discussion as the director of Intel, all that has to pass through us, uh, right? And, and all these questions, right, are part of those briefs, as, 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 you, as you can imagine. And now we end up with a lot of convergence across the MIGs and other places actually to, to, to get after that. And why? There's got to be a why. There's got to be some value proposition. And, and these are the three. There's the three with the Commandant of the Marine Corps, right, that we decided there's probably 103, but it's got to be three. And so we made it systems overmatch. We got to win the ones and zeros fight, right? Got to win it. You got to win the ones and zeros fight, right? There's back to that advantage. You, you, you need to do that. Uh, prevailing narrative. Goes without saying, right? We want to be on good ground. We got to be on good ground, or or we're going to be in a terrible place. And and when we're not on that good ground, we we tend right to have challenges. 
And then lastly, this was a big one and probably the most discussed one is this idea of resiliency. How do you take a punch? I mean, we don't really talk about that in most war fighting uh, aspects, but this gets after in this environment, right? You're, you're going to, you're going to take a punch, right? Disinformation, misinformation, bad news, right? I mean, you're just, you're going to take a punch. How do you create the resilience of your force in order to withstand that? I will tell you as a, as a wing commanding general crash an airplane. Oh my gosh. Right. It's like dragging a manhole cover. And, and certainly the tragedy of it all, right, is hard enough, but now it's all the information that goes along with it. Just very trying. So resiliency and a plan for it matters. So we, we took that and we just have a demonstration here and, you know, the, the, there's no accuracy in our, in, in our size of our squares, but, but I think it demonstrates what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go, right? This idea of Ukraine and Russia, classic case. If one were to look at order of battle, right? You give it all to the Russians, no doubt. Then, right, there's these other asymmetric things that come into the fight. And certainly the Starlink piece, this idea of prolific low Earth orbit capabilities and having C2 when and where you need it and not being able to disrupt it, Right, really something there, there. Certainly provided an advantage, and uh, it didn't come out on the slide, but that should be a shaded block up there that you know exceeds the Russian military strength. Uh, so, so this idea of, of what uh, Starlink does provides that systems overmatch. Of course, the narrative, you've, you've seen this in action. Obviously, uh, the president's pretty good at this, right? He's an actor, he's a comedian, right? He's been in front of audiences, he knows how to deliver and he does it and does it extremely well. And certainly, you know, there's things that that the coalition and other partners provide that help that. But uh, but no doubt good at it. And then ultimately, the resiliency required as well, not for the faint of heart, everything that's going on over there. Uh, but but just an, an illustration, a demonstration of what what that could be. So eight dash. 8-10 now gets into how we go practical application. How are we going to go from the theoretical cognitive big examples now into something a staff can put their arms around? So we, we go right to the joint force, we go right to the models that are used today from a staff planning standpoint and try bring information into this discussion. For the Marine Corps, fortunately, there's a commander responsible for that, and that's the MIG commander the MEF information group commander. So it's easy now for the MEF commander to bring this into his battle rhythm, right? In order to execute, to have a more wholesome discussion, this course of action development, wh whatever it may be, but it's someone accountable or responsible to account for this. So we've created this information tasking order, coordination order. Uh, I lived up at Fort Meade, you know, we did the cyber tasking order and our world revolved around it. I was an aviator, I did the air tasking order, my world revolved around it good or bad or indifferent, these orders, right, they synergize and create momentum and create tempo in an organization if you do it right, right? If you do it right, you get good at it. Obviously, there's a lot of imagination required. No two days are the same. But nonetheless, right, you start driving outcomes. The so what becomes, oh, right? It becomes, it becomes fairly uh, obvious and apparent, at least apparent, it may not be obvious. But pretty simple, but, right? This is how we're pushing it in from a planning standpoint in order to get this momentum, even to be told not quite right. So three math like off and running. So there are there are test case on all this and how they're doing it, specifically the MIG, but certainly with a meth commander and a Mark IV commander, Mark IV pack very much into this uh, as well. General Journey has always been a huge advocate and uses his used his MIG is about as good as I've seen. East uh, George Smith the same always always did it very well. So so I'm. Um, Again, nothing fancy here. And then how does it fit from, from a, a doctrinal standpoint? And believe it or not, as we've been writing this doctrine and writing these uh, reference publications and warfighting publications, the Joint Staff has been like, like with us, very interested in how we're doing this. Again, not solving world hunger, you know, we're not fixing global warming, uh, but, but we gotta get after this, right? got to get after this. We got to gain some momentum even to deviate from, damn it, right? But we got to go there or, or we're not, what the hell just happened? We, we, we can't, can't go through that again. So uh, 
really uh, infant stages, small steps, lots of writing, lots of practical application, lots of feedback, what's next, what's next, what's next to, to what we're trying to do to really get this kind of mainstream. Because ultimately, and, and of, you know, force design, force design's a thing. It is our driving force. So don't let anybody uh, tell you otherwise. There is, there is no lack of momentum. We are on the cusp, uh, actually delivering things that were discussed in the last bit, right? Things that General Berger said we're going to deliver, we're delivering. And uh, really making a difference, really making a difference. But this idea of force design, you know, not, not backing away from it at all. I, I wrote this article with General Shuttler. General Shuttler is a 95-year-old Marine, was in Korea. He's a uh, F-4 pilot. Uh, he brought in the EA-6B to the Marine Corps. He brought in the TPS-59 long-range radar into the Marine Corps. He made the Marine Air Command and Control System something. He made aviation maintenance a big thing, a big deal in order to make readiness our calling card. Uh, neat guy, 95 years old. And he calls me. I had him speak at Second Mall one time, so I've known him a, a while now. And he says, Skirt, I, I've been trying to get this article published, you know, 10 years now, 12, probably longer. And uh, can you help? I said, sir, yeah, let's have lunch. So this 95-year-old man walks all the way up from the visitor center, all the way up to my office, all the way down to the second half mess. And we get there around 1130 and they're throwing us out at two o'clock, right? He's brought all his books. He's brought all his, his uh, uh, research. You guys would love it, all the professors. I mean, this guy is a student of the game, 95 years old. I said, we're going to write a damn article. We're going to write a damn, even if, Got to pull a few strings. We're doing it. But 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 what a neat guy. And he's he's thoughtful. He says, you know, you guys are telling your story all wrong. This is a continuation of Halsey and Vandergriff, right? They set the stage for all this. You could just imagine him talking. And, you know, I'm just taking it all in like, you know, kid and, kid and candy store. And, and just so awed by this Marine and what he stands for. Always disruptive. All those capabilities are off the beaten path. The A6B and, and even TPS rate and things we, you know, have really met the most to the joint force at the end of the day as a wing CG and the guy sundowning all those EA-6Bs, right? Really meant a lot to the joint force, that airplane and what it did. Uh, yeah, could talk a long time about him. But this idea of designing a force with, with, a, with, with a fighting foot ashore was, was brilliant. You know, as, as we came up from the Solomon Islands to the Gilberts, to the Marianas, Philippines, Iwo Jima into Okinawa, right? all that combined arm stuff that we were beginning to understand and truly do it from a naval standpoint fits perfectly to what we're doing today. And, and it does, and you know it, right? This, this, this is a maritime fight, right? This is the fleet admiral. This is the fleet commander driving sea control, driving missions up and down this terrain, right? That thanks to our, our grandfathers and our great grandfathers, they provided us this, right? That, that, that's the opportunity, you know, the, the Marine Corps as a value proposition to the joint force can provide. We're there, right? We're there literally day in and day out. Many of you have lived there, right? This is a natural, a natural occurrence for the Marine Corps and, and certainly other parts of the joint force. But we got a chunk of the Marine Corps out there living this and really doing this extremely well. But this matters, right? Placement and access matters, especially when I start talking about the rest of the things I need to do from information as a warfighting function. It matters, right? It matters. Of course, you know, when we always have a discussion on tanks and, and other things, I say, man, I'm not sure how tanks are going to get around that, but uh, just a bad joke. Uh, so as part of force design, as, as we wanted to complement the MIGs, right, and figure out how could we take authorities, approvals, capabilities that exist at functional combatant commanders, cyber space, and how, how can we provide that to the operating force? How, and, and provide it in an implied way, right? Every, obviously, everything goes by with and through the geographical COCOM. I know you're taught all that. But, but how can one gain momentum, right, by, by looking at these capabilities that exist 
at Fort Meade, right? Title 10, Title 50, and capabilities that, li that exist out in Colorado Springs and Chantilly. And how can we create interior lines communication to get shit done, right? This stuff's really hard. Going through the authorities and approval process on this, not for the faint of heart, right? Capabilities that we can bring to bear, right? Going to NSA and other places, Cybercom, Marines forward, deployed, really a unique opportunity if the stand in force concept is going to be a reality. So the Marine Corps Information Command uh, is really this idea of having this service retained. General Berger used to call me at Mar 4 Cyber and he'd ask me something about Queen Elizabeth deployment and cyber or this and 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 you can repeat this to him since he's no longer the commandant. I'd be thinking to myself, hey, bro, I don't work for you, right? Not really, not really. But, but that was a fact. I didn't work for him, and I, should, I, I needed to. And so that's why we created this. So he calls, man, I'm snapping and popping, right? Snapping and popping, direct order, lawful order, all the right C2 in place to have a service-retained force sitting at Fort Meade with one foot in Colorado Springs in order to fully understand what these functional combatant commanders are going to provide the joint force and to get a to get a get get a leg up, right? Get some momentum going. And General Nakasone, huge fan of this. And you know, through his authorities, and both of those COCOMs have global deployment authority. That's like really important, right? Both of those COCOMs have global deployment authority. Because you know, right, I can't move forces from one COCOM to another COCOM without Secretary of Defense saying so. Service, Secretary of Defense orders book you, right? That shit is hard, really hard, right? This just creates this momentum. And, and you know, General Nakasone, I mentioned his name a lot, but, but very adaptive, very innovative, very disruptive. The idea of pushing cyber mission elements out from under US Cybercom authority, direct support to stand in forces in the first island chain. Think about the opportunity that has on an enduring op order out of US Cyber Command. And the same thing, an SDOB going in the book here this month from Spacecom doing similar. Uh, little old Marine Corps, like we're the smallest of all these forces, like way small. And sometimes being small has that adaptable trait to it that we've been able to do. But this is just about working in the information, information war fighting function and how do we gain momentum tempo, especially when we don't have the stuff or the authorities or the approvals. It's a way. And you know, I always get in this fight. Well, damn it, we need to move all those down to the to the operating forces. We need to move all those authorities down. And I got no problem with that. And you can sign me up to that decades-long discussion and, and probably things that I, I do. And I engage Congress and Senate on that as part of my job. But uh, we're on the clock, right? We got shit to do today, tomorrow, the next day. Right. This this has got there's got to be a way in order to maximize these these opportunities. OK, so uh, E. Smith comes in. God bless him. And uh, first thing he says, OK, you know, Joe Berger did all this. And of course, these commandants are all right. They're going to oh, what's the next thing we're going to do? Hey, I, I want you to create this strategy and vision and you're going you're going to drive it into the rest of the Marine Corps because we're not moving fast enough. Obviously, he's probably scolding me as he's giving me this great job, but 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 right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna drive it in. So this uh, the concept that we've developed, and I'm just sharing it with you, is this idea of fighting smart, right? Pretty appropriate if we're gonna be data centric, if we're gonna have data drive outcomes, data drive decisions, data drive how we are going to do so we gain that advantage. Fighting smart, of course, if you're MCDP one. Acolytes, right? It's the last two words in MCDP one. It's a philosophy for fighting smart, you know, characterizing MCDP one. So, so this is kind of what we're looking at as we do our campaigning of sorts. Uh, I got the team right out, not not right now out at Mar Four Pack. Mar Four Pack really getting after this, right? They got they got urgency in their uh, front lights, headlights, and so we're, we're putting this together and uh, ultimately classic commandant signature. It's going to be much, it's it's about technology as well. It we're, we're going to go there. We're, you know, right now, as I review the palm, the information portfolio for the commandant in my supervisory role, right, I look at this stuff, I'm saying, man, this, we've been 
trying to put this thing together for four or five years, some of it longer, and it's all got to change, right? We got to get out of our hardware centric approach, black box, black box, black box. I've it's too long in aviation. I despise black boxes, right? This is really about or hardware at some, you know, very precise level, right? Not insignificant. It's about software, right? It's about this continuing changing, making your own luck approach and of certainly how we're gonna interact in massing data, right? The whole joint fires network, everything Indopaycom is doing is, is truly busting all those doors. So data is fully available when and where you need it at the right security level. And, and that's important too. We can't be reckless in how we do it. Anyway, this is just our approach. We're focusing on three things, right? People, readiness, and ultimately modernization. And, uh, and, and we're, we're going we're gonna to give it our damnedest and trying to push the next step of this. And we're also doing a, a, a reference publication for, for the MIGs. So that's, again, big part of my job is from thought to paper to to, as you know, it's just the starting point. You write something, you sign it. Now the, the fleet either gonna adopt or not and uh, push back or not for us to improve. Okay, last slide, ready for questions here, but uh, I was a huge Boyd fan, still am, still am a huge Boyd fan, was going down the 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing, was really enamored by the UDA loop, uh, basically the air combat maneuvering doctrine of, of, uh, of the joint force writ large, those maneuvers that we do in basic fighter maneuvers, Boyd's, like he developed all that shit uh, out at fighter weapon, the Nellis Fighter Weapons School. Just a brilliant, brilliant guy. But obviously his claim to fame is all the strategic side of what he created. The F-16 turned 50 years old, 4,500 of those modern airplanes still on the street today. One of the most prolific fighters uh, in the world, the most prolific fighter in the world. Uh, the F-16 was built around two people, the pilot and the maintainer. Right, the ergonomics on the airplane is absolutely amazing. Uh, it's a nine. You got to, you know, it's a nine G airplane. You got to go out and pull nine Gs to be a twenty seven G missile, and then taking a motor in and out of that airplane, hours, a couple. Uh, so, so Boyd, very much, and and everybody thinks Boyd was a counter technologist. In some respects, he was, but he just wanted to make sure that people were the most important side of it, and whether it was tanks, Marconi's radios or the internal combustion engine and tanks and vehicles, at the end of the day, the people who put the most into their people got the most out of it. And again, dark side of the force, but you know, the whole Brit Blitzkrieg concept is one of Boyd's favorite examples of how that is done when they had the least amount of everything, but yet used it the best. People, all about people. All right, hey, I'll just end it where I started it. And thank you, you know, from the bottom of my heart, uh, what you're doing it, what you're doing, the fact that you have so much talent, uh, can do so much in life. You're here, you're studying, you're making yourselves better. You're gonna make the joint force better, says a lot about you and I don't take it for granted. Certainly uh, the commandant we got to talk to the other day, doing great, uh, would also uh, echo that and wanna tell you that in person. Hopefully he can here soon. All right, thanks again. God bless you all and have a great, great day. All right, thank you.